Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Test Tubes and Cauldrons, a podcast where we talk about the science behind spirituality. So before we get into our new series that we're going to be starting today, I'm going to pass it off to Hanny to do our What Happened on This Day. Hanny, go ahead and take it away. So today was a great day for physics. Uh, we had the birthdays of at least three influential people in the field. And the first was Svetlana Yekgeneva Savitskaya in 1948. Svetlana is a Russian cosmonaut and aerospace engineer who was the first woman to walk in space in 1984. She was also the first woman to make two trips into space, both to the Salyut 7 space station. Earlier in her life, she'd been an aviator, set 18 women's world records, and won, won a World Aerobatics Championship in 1970. From 1976, she was a test pilot and joined the Russian space program in 1980. I think... Um, the theme of this episode is going to be overachievers, <laughs> just as a, um, a spoiler. There were also two other important physicists born on this day. This included Sir Roger Penrose in 1931, whose mathematical contributions to the field of physics helped us to understand black holes. And finally, it was the birthday of Ernest Orlando Lawrence in 1901, a physicist awarded the 1939 Nobel Prize for his invention of the cyclotron. These devices, such as those seen at CERN, collide particles at extremely high speeds and help us to understand the fundamental properties of matter. So we are going to be starting a new series today called Occultists and Scientists. And the, basically the premise of this series is looking back through history at people who have had a big influence on both the scientific and the occult communities. And we mentioned in a couple episodes ago, I don't recall which one specifically it was in, a man by the name of Emanuel Swedenborg and how he had a large impact on, I think it was our psychic and paranormal episode, the development of like the idea behind spiritual healing and also interaction with like angels and the divine. And so we decided to do a deeper dive into Swedenborg for this episode. And wow, we have found a lot. <laughs> we hope you find it as enjoyable as we have in terms of researching it. So let's see if we get into who Emanuel Swedenborg was. Also, it was our Psychic Sun Paranormal episode, which I believe was episode 18. So that's the one that we mentioned Swedenborg in. All right, strap in, folks. Okay, here's a brief overview of Emanuel Swedenborg. So Emanuel Swedenborg was born in Stockholm, Sweden. I know his name is very convenient. <laughs> in 1688, and he lived until 1772. So he lived a fairly long time, and he died in London, England. He lived during the height of the Enlightenment, which would strongly reflect his life works, how he would react against Enlightenment or uh, would later influence later movements. His father, Jesper Swedberg, was an influential pastor in the Lutheran Church, and many of his views would later influence his son as well. Swedenborg really was a jack of all trades and a master of quite a few of them. He was a well-traveled and well-read individual. Many scientists, philosophers, occultists, and writers in years to come would all cite Swedenborg uh, as their influence. Here's a short but notable list of figures. Carl Jung, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Balzac, Dostoevsky, Charles Baudelaire, the Grand Master of Freemasonry in Sweden, Kant, Margaret Fuller, W.B. Yeats, Helen Keller, and more. His life's mission was to seek out and understand the spiritual world by examining the physical. As we mentioned in our Psychics episode, Swedenborg actually coined the term correspondence in an effort to reconcile this connection, but we'll talk about correspondences later. Yeah, so Swedenborg initially actually started off as a scientist. That was really where he began his career. For much of his life, he was a scientist and inventor. While he seemed particularly interested in physics and engineering, there was really no area of science that went unexamined by him. And these included, like I said, physics and engineering, botany, geology, zoology, geometry, chemistry, astronomy, anatomy, metallurgy, and many more. And his scientific quest was always underpinned by his desire to understand the divine and how it lived and breathed in us. And this caused him to voraciously really study anatomy and map out one of the first understandings of the nervous system and the protoneuron theory and also just the brain and the many different components. And he also had a surprising presentient idea of the function of the pituitary gland. So I'm going to quote something that he wrote, or that was written, sorry, by the Swedenborg Foundation. He described the blood as containing a fine substance called a spirituous fluid, which he theorized contained the power of the soul. And he also extended his theories on the formation of matter to human beings, arguing that every aspect of our, of our development and our being is determined by the soul, that is, by power flowing into us from the infinite. Swedenborg also argued that the seat of the soul was in the brain, and specifically in the cerebral cortex. 
And I found it very interesting that Swedenborg also described many modern scientific theories long before their discovery by current scientists. And actually, in the first volume of his Philosophical and Logical Works, Swedenborg described his philosophy of nature, and he posited that matter consists of particles that are indefinitely divisible and in constant vertical or spinning motion, which I thought was crazy because we now know that electrons have either a positive or a negative spin, and this was nearly a century before the discovery of the atom by Dalton, who then proposed his atomic theory. And even further from that, actually, he continued stating that these particles were themselves formed of smaller particles in motion. And you could either consider this to be quarks or even think about it on like a larger scale, larger, it's still a small scale, but a larger scale being the atom kind of as the whole part. And then you could break it down into smaller parts being the neutron, the proton, and the electron. That was wild. It was so, so long before Dalton's um, proposed theory of the atom that Swedenborg is over here just like figuring out electron spin. What do people, like, what do you both think about the whole idea of the blood containing this like spirituous fluid or the power of the soul? I don't know. I feel like that that has some grounding in historical religions as well as it, it was a huge influence, I think, on on later philosophical and theological ideas, as we'll see. Definitely very interesting. He he really went hard <laughs> when he was looking at anatomy. I mean, that was one of the reasons why he studied anatomy and sort of I mapped out like the nervous system was because he wanted to understand the soul. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, blood is is one of the many reasons that we're alive and it goes through pretty much all parts of our body and it also runs through every animal yeah it reminds me a lot kind of of the idea of like the alchemical fire being something that like is what gives gives life um this idea of the spirituous fluid obviously a little, a little bit different one being more in an alchemical sense this one being a little bit less so but still kind of the same commonality between those two concepts applies here yeah i didn't get a chance to to look too much into his works into metallurgy important to note he was like the the royal one of the royal mine assessors because mm-hmm. <laughs> like sweden was a huge mining country at that time and so that's why metallurgy was important to him and i didn't get quite to look into too much but there seemed to be a little bit of connection between his beliefs and like metallurgy and some early like alchemy yeah quite a lot actually i did look into it because i saw that it was connected to yeah i had a feeling i was like i feel like astro will like this <laughs> yeah so i did look into it and yeah swedenberg he dived a lot into metallurgy and again, trying to connect that like with the divine and the different minerals that were being dug up. And that's where we get a lot of our mineral correspondences from is actually from Swedenborg's initial works with metallurgy and then later taking some of that and then changing it into like using alchemical terms. So yeah, he definitely pioneered some of like the classical metallurgic terms and stuff that you see in alchemy. So he also ran in the academic circles of several very influential scientists, such as Sir Isaac Newton. He was a notable theoretical inventor coming up with sketches for things like a machine with whose aid a man could rise into the air and travel aloft, or not what that could be, a kind of boat in which one could travel underwater and wherever one wanted, and a universal musical instrument by the aid of which the most unskilled in music can play on all kinds of harmonies that are found in the score, which is incredibly prescient. Um, he also established Sweden's first scientific journal, which he called Daedalus Hyperboreus, which is quite neat. Which, so these are incredibly prescient ideas. But he did also take a kind of sharp left turn into spirituality. He referred to himself as a spiritual fisherman, someone who investigates and teaches natural truths, and afterwards spiritual truth rationally. After this, several mystical experiences happen. happen. Oh, I just want to say I really like that he calls <laughs> his, his journal Daedalus Hyperboreus because Hyperborea... Some people assume to be in Scandinavia. Daedalus, obviously the classical inventor. I just was like, oh, I love like, uh, not only is he a genius, he's also very witty. <laughs> God, he has it all. So yeah, in the in 1743 and 1744 at age 54 and 55. So definitely quite like later in life, especially at that time, he began experiencing nightly mystical visions. So at this time, he was in service to the Kingdom of Sweden, like I mentioned, and he actually petitioned them so that way they would release him from their service and he could uh, pursue a full time dedication to theology and mysticism. So this was granted to him. Now, they he was able to like keep like half of his salary, I think, which is how you know he kept surviving he actually never returned to his scientific career he actually had several visions that kind of told him to stop there's one where he had like a vision in a in a bar in london which i think is pretty funny and like the lord appeared to him in a tavern in the dark in london and i'm like that sounds who amongst us does not have that happen (laughs) (laughs) yeah honestly um so that was part of the reason why he actually it was 
he thought that his scientific career was putting himself too much, like giving himself too much credit instead of God. So although his scientific uh, research was a clear influence on his beliefs, he believed nature and the divine were interconnected and that nature without the creative energy of the divine would be dead. He tried again and again to explain how the finite is related to the infinite and how the soul is connected to the physical body. As one can imagine, his teachings were not well received by the Swedish Lutheran Church. So he actually moved to England to publish his work in London uh, in an effort to not be censored as Swedish or Sweden had a very harsh anti-heresy uh, laws at the time. So most notably, he had some several like very starkly different theological views which got him in trouble with the Lutheran Church. Uh, one of the big ones is that he advocated against a common sense reading of the Bible. So this is actually where he created the term correspondences. We'll touch a lot more on correspondences later. But he basically believed that the Bible was a book of correspondences of how the spiritual world was reflected in the physical. He was also a pluralist, which is very heretical. This basically is the idea instead of like three persons in one, like God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, he believed that they were all three individual beings and not the same person which is wow <laughs> that, that that was a huge point of contention at the council of nicaea additionally he also did not believe in like the last judgment or the last days he actually believed that it had already happened specifically he gave the year 1757 don't know exactly why but he said that's the year that it took place and it happened in the spiritual realm and we could feel the effects in the physical world, most notably the loss of spiritual free will. Another one that he did not agree with, which was a huge thing in Lutheranism, was faith alone. He did not believe that faith alone was enough to get someone into heaven. He believed that works had to do that, that works alongside of faith was what would get you into heaven. And actually, from what I was reading about his works, it seemed to be that he almost believed that you didn't have to be a Christian to get to heaven and it seemed to be more like as long as your ideas subscribe to god's ideas of love and wisdom that that was enough to then get you into what he called heaven yeah so this is actually really interesting because he he was definitely an ominous claiming that kind of all religions started from a core belief in one god although there was some kind of like condescension because he continued by saying that um some religions might have misunderstood some aspects of divine teachings mm -hmm. and thus came to believe in many gods but he definitely was of the opinion that whether or not you go to heaven or hell is truly based upon your works. And it doesn't matter what religion you're in. If you lived a good life and your kind of dominant love, the city that we'll touch upon a little bit later in the episode, was good, then you would go to heaven. It wouldn't matter what you believed in in life itself. Yeah. I also th thought his ideas on heaven and hell were very, like a lot of his ideas seem very like Unitarian Universalist, just in terms of some of their, the like openness of them. Mm -hmm. So he basically believed that like heaven and hell, and we're going to talk a little bit about the realms of the afterlife, which he talked about. But basically it was this idea that you would end up where you were most comfortable. So he didn't believe in the devil or Satan, but rather that each like a person took on that role that a, a person who had a wicked heart would take on the role of Satan and that a person who had a, a goodly heart would take on the role of angels. And so it, I think there's the quote that like, no, yeah, there are no beings in either heaven and hell who are not ones living on earth. That is very starkly different than beliefs at this time. So yeah, I thought that his his ideas of the afterlife are, are honestly, I, I get behind them. <laughs> uh, they're, they're very starkly different than beliefs at that time. And even his idea of humanity, like if you look into the way that he defined what being a human means, it's actually very different than the way the church would have defined it at the time. And being that he also considered God to have like human characteristics. And for him, being a human was less about like the physical ways in which we we are human because animals main, like maintain many of those same physical characteristics. But the difference was that humans have the ability to engage with divinity and then express similar characteristics as you did more good and became more divine through the regeneration process, which he described as like kind of the spiritual growth that one experiences during their lifetime. Towards nearing-ish the end of his life, um, well, last couple decades, I would say, he was known to have experienced multiple prophetic visions. So he once recounted a fire to a whole dinner party that was happening 250 miles away. He like started freaking out. And they were like, what's wrong? He's like, there's houses and they're burning. And he went into great detail. And it would have been like impossible for a word to have reached them at this time. And the time that he 
predicted it happening lined up with the time that it actually started. And I think it was several hours later, if not like a couple days later, that word finally reached where he was staying. And the, the messenger was like, uh, this is like lines up exactly with what happened. Another interesting time was, was right before he died, actually. So his final days were shrouded in prophecy. He wrote to John Wesley, founder of Methodism, that it would not be possible for them to meet because he would soon pass on March 29th. So what's interesting about this is Wesley had actually had an interest in meeting Swedenborg, but had not expressed this interest to anyone. And Swedenborg reached out to Wesley and was like, oh, yeah, the angels told me that you wanted to talk. <laughs> so I figured I'd reach out to you. And Wesley was like, oh, can we meet at this time? And Swedenborg was like, nah, I'm going to be dead by then. <laughs> I was like, okay. Here's a quote from book Swedenborg Epic. Uh, in Swedenborg's final hours, his friend Pastor Ferelius told him some people thought he had written his theology just to make a name for himself and asked Swedenborg if he would like to recant. Raising himself on his bed, his hand on his heart, Swedenborg earnestly replied, As truly as you see me before your eyes, so true is everything that I have written, and I could have said more had it been permitted. When you in enter eternity, you will see everything, and then you and I shall have a lot to talk about. True his work, Swedenborg died rather joyously on March 29th, 1772. Yeah, I say joyously because his servant remarked that he was preparing uh, the end of the last week of his life. He was acting like he was going to go on vacation <laughs> and, and have a grand old time and seemed to be rather excited about it, which makes sense given his experiences with the afterlife. Yeah, given his, you know, personal cosmology. Yeah. And his his death had a lot of influences, which we're now going to get. Into. Yeah. So we're going to get into, yeah, Swedenborg's influence kind of after his death. And the biggest one I would say is definitely the idea of correspondence. So to touch on and go over Swedenborg's cosmology a little bit, he essentially believed that all of creation has a divinely established order that starts at the very top, which he denotes as the Lord. Although his definition of the Lord is less than a Christian meaning and more as the Lord being this kind of ultimate creator. And it extends this hierarchy, extends down through the heavens and then the world of spirits until it reaches the natural world, which is the level at which things have physical existence. Now, each level is a less perfect reflection of the one above it. So heaven is a manifestation of the Lord, the creator, but its inhabitants are not as spiritually pure as the creator, and thus they cannot live on this or exist on the same level as the Lord. And then the world of spirits is below heaven and is kind of an intermediate realm. And then the lower realm can consist of both good and evil spirits, that res and it resembles our world visually because it is so close to the physical realm. So, for example, in the spiritual world, Swedenborg says that the omnipresent radiance of divinity is compared to the sun of the natural world. And the divine love that permeates the universe is like the heat of the sun. And the divine wisdom that provides order to everything is the light of the sun. So together, the heat of divine love and the light of divine wisdom permeate everything that exists, hence sustaining all living things, both in the natural and in the spiritual world. And that kind of correspondence to something that Swedenborg could like persist through his cosmology and the way that he believed the natural world tied with the physical world. It's also the way he told people to read the scriptures was more on this correspondence based level and less as like a literal book in fact the story of genesis i recall reading he said it was less about creation and more about like showing people how to like start so showing people the process of regeneration essentially so starting from this child and then growing and reaching this divine level where you would essentially land yourself in heaven or at one with the lord or the divine being the most important correspondences of Swedenborg were the star, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Does that sound familiar to any Bible story? So the star represented knowledge from heaven and gold to the celestial goodness, frankincense to spiritual goodness, and then myrrh to natural goodness. According to Swedenborg, these components were the basis for all worship and following correspondences. He believed that the ancient people used to know and understand correspondences how the natural world was used to represent the spiritual, but we had since forgotten. Of course, it's also important to note here that Swedenborg also referred to correspondences in a numerological sense, claiming that he received patterns of numbers during his correspondences with angels. And these numbers would correspond to general concepts in the same way that particular words or items would. Stating that, this is a quote, I have also seen writings from heaven, which consisted of nothing but numbers, set down in an orderly series, just as in writings composed of letters and words. 
and I have been instructed that this writing is from the inmost heaven, and that their heavenly writing takes the form of numbers, when the thought of the superior angel, angels descends to a lower heaven. This numerical writing also involves mysteries, some of which can neither be comprehended by thought nor expressed by words. And this is the important part here. All numbers, like words, have their correspondence, and therefore a meaning in accordance therewith. But there is this difference, that numbers involve general ideas, and words particular ideas. And since one general idea involves countless particulars, numerical writing involves more mysteries than writing composed of letters. From all this, it is evident to me that, in the word, numbers, as well as words, have their signification. What the simple numbers as 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12 signify, and what the compound as 20, 30, 50, 70, 100, 144, and so on, and others, may be seen in the Arcana Coelestia, where they are treated of. In this writing in heaven, the number on which those following in a series depend, as on their subject, is always placed first, for that number indicates the subject treated of, and from that number, those which follow derive their special relation to the subject. So that's a lot. About, so those are like angel numbers. Yeah. I feel like, I feel like. It's so angel I, numbers. I, I couldn't believe I found something on it. I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> I like just now, because I hadn't read that part of the outline. I am like, wait a minute. We've been, I feel like so many people in like just I've been in have been trying to find the source of angel numbers. Oh my God, it's right here. What? Wow, my mind has been blown so many times today from this guy. <laughs> yeah. Wanna, Amy, did yeah. you find anything else on this? No, I didn't. I found that quote, but um, I couldn't find very much. Um, it seemed like these were his experiences with um, with angels because I think Fel mentioned that he had some kind of prophetic visions, but he also had these kind of communications or correspondences. Um, I think there is more in the um, Arcana Coelestica, which is one of his like prominent works, um, but I didn't find um, much on kind of the specifics of each number. Right, and like what they, I'd be curious now to look up like what each one means. Well, wow, my mind is like, I've been so like, oh, it was just like, what's her name? Um, coming up with angel numbers, but like, what? <laughs> there is some mystic basis here. Wow. I'm really, I'd be really curious to know kind of what he, like the difference that he sees between the singular and also the compound and like how complex the compound numbers, like how that impacts the message that is like trying to be given throughout that. Definitely, I'm going to look into this, this book a little bit more because I'm really curious to see kind of what exactly he means there and how he would expand upon that. So we did look into his influence on energy work and energy healing. Um, Fel, I think, looked into it a little bit more than me. But this is interesting, obviously, because energy healing, I think, is often referred to as one of these kind of new age things, whereas maybe there's a little bit more uh, mystic basis to it than that. So while Swedenborg himself never advocated for spiritual and energy healing, prominent spiritualist Andrew Jackson Davis claimed to have been visited by Swedenborg himself, who he claimed taught him the act of spiritual healing. Davis then taught this to other spiritualists, and many Swedenborgians considered themselves homeopaths and mental healers. They took Swedenborg's idea of the interconnectedness of the spiritual and physical to a very literal level. So um, although I didn't find very many direct writings from Swedenborg himself on this, I did find quite a few quotes from Davis's Harmonia of Philosophy, um, which kind of explain this connection, and I think they provide a sort of historical basis for this idea of energy healing. So Davis very much believed in the material nature of spirits, so this kind of goes some way to explaining his belief in spirit and energy healing, because he believed that these material forces could be harnessed to promote health. For example, he believed that the spirit as well as the body heals each defective structure. All effort to restore equilibrium is made by the soul principle with due regard to the law of periodical changes, and the true treatment for the healing of all diseased parts of organs will be governed by the kind, period, and degree of effort which the soul is putting forth in the physical economy. So this entire text is kind of referring to one's works and deeds as kind of astra mentioned earlier there's this idea of getting closer to the divine by performing good deeds and being a good person and this was kind of seen as a, a way to promote health and there are also some interesting ideas in there um, about the actual <laughs> the nature of the body so this is again it's davis not swedenborg but he said the food we eat the air we breathe the water we drink contains more or less of the gross kinds of magnetism and electricity but they are refined and supplemented by entering the batteries of the human body what was mineral electricity and terrestrial magnetism yesterday may by this process tomorrow uh, constitute a part of our thinking principle. 
In perfect health, the serous and mucous membranes constantly generate positive and negative forces. So I guess there is a little bit of chemistry to this, but it's deeply connected to his idea of spiritual healing. And I think it's interesting because I think that this can be connected quite a lot now to the sort of more new age ideas we have about, well, not we have, but that, that, that particular community has about energy, energy healing, how it actually works on a physical level. Phil, what did you find in regards to this? It was mostly talking about uh, Andrew Jackson Davis. Basically, Swedenborg himself never really wrote about energy healing, but a lot of people who were energy healers were highly influenced by Swedenborg. In fact, oh my God, what's her name? I always delete it from my brain. The woman who founded Christian Science, uh, she doesn't serve <laughs> Her name said she was uh, many think that she was actually like a, a Swedenborgian Swedenborgian and was heavily influenced by his ideas. I think a lot of people drew conclusions about energy healing with Swedenborg's works because he was so like this is like the body and the mind and the spirit are all connected. And so people kind of took it to the next step, which was that could heal the body with the mind. Although Swedenborg, to my knowledge, never actually advocated for any of that. I do recall reading something that Swedenborg um, kind of coined this idea of like oscillations and vibrations in the brain as being the means of which communication occur between neurons. And that could definitely have been a foundation for the idea of like vibrations being kind of this part of like energetic spiritual healing and that you have these like good and low vibrations. Actually thinking about it, this idea of good, like high and low vibrations or like good deeds leading to like higher vibrations and like bad deeds leading to lower vibrations. You definitely see a connection to be made there with that kind of thinking and clearly with like spiritual healing. It wouldn't surprise me if that idea of oscillations being the way that we communicate within our brains kind of maybe made that made a connection there as well. But also like that's him basically summarizing brain waves like a century yeah. before we even had any idea of neural anatomy. That is incredible mm-hmm. stuff. All right, so let's talk about angels and the structure of, of heaven. It's all very fascinating stuff. Um, I had a great time researching this. So Swedenborg assort, asserts in many places that, like I mentioned earlier, God is not only human, but uniquely and definitely, definitively so. Thus, he rejects the commonly held notion of a divine being who lives in heaven and is separated from humanity. And because of this, he asserts that angels were once a human being living on earth, and that all people on earth have the potential to be angels, regardless of where they're from or what they practice, like we mentioned earlier. And if we don't end up in heaven, it's be- in heaven as angels, it's because of the choices that we make in life. So then, contrary to that, demons or evil spirits were people who are so immersed in physical pleasures or bound up in their own ego that they refuse to let them go and reach this kind of higher level by doing good works. Um, A quote that I want to read here that explains this really well is that on the grounds of all my experience, which has lasted for several years now, I can say with full confidence that in their form, angels are completely human. They have faces, eyes, ears, chest, arms, hands, and feet. They see each other, hear each other, and talk to each other. In short, they lack nothing that belongs to humans, except that they are not clothed with a material body. And Jesper, his father, Furthermore, held the unconventional belief that angels and spirits were present in everyday life. And again, we see that this clearly had a very strong impact on Swedenborg's cosmology. So this was a quote that I had read in our Psychics and Paranormal episode. So in the spiritual world, people have bodies, live in houses, enjoy community life, and are surrounded by landscapes that are like those of Earth with familiar plants and animals. However, things work very differently in spirituality. Everything there is vivid and much more alive. What we see responds to what we are thinking. We always have all the time we need. Particular individuals are only as near or as far away as our thoughts of them. And thinking of a person or place can actually bring us there. Uh, What was interesting, this is kind of a sidebar, but I thought this idea was really sweet, actually. He had this idea that uh, part of the angels' jobs were to raise children who had died before their parents. And I was like, oh, God, that's really, like, touching. I was like, wow, okay. So it was basically this idea that that heaven is not so different from our life. Just the, the main thing is that it's so close to the divine love of God and that angels love what they're doing. Um, They love their, they do their work because they love it. It's, it's not like there's, there's not like bills to pay or like politics from my understanding, but there are like communities that are 
pure. And yeah, the communities are based around what people love, based around this idea of like what their dominant love has been through life. And so to continue on with kind of this discussion of the different levels, there were three specific levels. There was the world of spirits, kind of that intermediate area of sorting out zone, um, where then people who had passed on would be sorted into heaven or hell. And in the world of spirits, our friends and our relatives become our spirit guides. And people can stay in this realm for a year or more until their true nature is revealed. And here in this world of spirits, those who did not find love on earth, Swedenborg said, will eventually find their perfect match in heaven, for no one is ever alone unless they wish to be. And Swedenborg believed that because at first the spirit world reflects the real world to the deceased, they may actually deny that they're dead essentially saying to the angels, like, no, I'm not dead. I'm still very much alive. But it wasn't until their inner nature is revealed that things would begin to change. And eventually people would reveal their inner nature without fear or care of judgment. And it's at this point that it becomes apparent who has a dominant love of what is good and who has a dominant love of what is evil. So no judge in his cosmology passes a sentence of like guilty or innocent, but instead we seek out kindred spirits or kind of these dominant loves of which are good or evil that we feel most drawn to. So in essence, Swedenborg doesn't really believe that hell is a punishment. It's more of this place where those of ill intentions or who have this dominant love of what is quote unquote evil um, feel the most comfortable. So they have essentially chosen a path that is opposite of love and wisdom. And there's nothing more that the angels or anybody else can do for them, which I thought was really, really interesting. And to continue touching upon this idea of kind of true will and dominant love here, he had a surprisingly similar idea to the concept of kind of this, the idea of true will, like we hear it described often within the occult community and even in like new religious movements and also in like Thelema. And so he placed a huge emphasis on love and divine love that should inspire will and understanding as like that being the binding force of the universe. But instead of defining it as like will, he called it one's dominant love. And developing one's dominant love is a gradual process, according to Swedenberg, that consists of many different choices throughout um, our lives. And ultimately, the number of good, quote unquote good, and quote unquote evil loves that a person has throughout the entirety of their life reflects the essence of one's dominant love. And then this also plays a part, as I was mentioning earlier, on where a person ends up in the spiritual realms. If one's dominant love is that of material wealth or pleasure, then they'll go to hell, a place where they feel most comfortable because those are the things that are most important. Whereas a dominant love centered around providing for people in need would lead one to heaven because that they would be a part of a community whose dominant love reflects the same thing, something that is quote unquote good, and thus they would like rise up into heaven yeah i thought it's all very interesting (laughs) what do you guys think about that cosmology i actually really (laughs) i actually really like it i think it's it's very it's so drastically different than like every theology like dominant christian theology of that time i mean it makes sense why he was branded as a heretic (laughs) yeah i mean it's it's so much less dogmatic than you'll go to hell if you do this and it's also very um pointed in a way because it's it's kind of a critique i think in some ways of like church fathers who might not have been walking the way that they preach and like was just like just because you're a christian doesn't mean you're gonna go to heaven oh yeah like i vibe with that because you know how many politicians there are they're like i'm a christian um and according to swedenborg's cosmology well that ain't that ain't enough yeah i th- i also thought the idea that hell was not a punishment was was also very different because it was like these people i think there he was also kind of quoted as saying that the god or angels don't torture people in hell that they torture each other which i think is is also very like sartre right like hell is other people (laughs) but from a less pessimistic point of view in my opinion he made it very relatable in the sense that like angels and demons are people whose desires simply differed and i think that was a very different perspective than many people had at the time and i also like that there was no kind of demonization of like i mean there kind of is because there's like good and evil fine but like generally compared to how what most organized religions you know preaches good and evil in this idea of heaven and hell it's definitely much less judgmental and it's more of like they're just descending or ascending to a place where they feel comfortable and like that's it which i thought was really 
strikingly different from many of the ideas at the time and also currently that people hold in society. I actually have a question about his cosmology. So if you are a bad person in this in this uh, concept and you go to hell, which you're not being punished, but you are kind of around other people who are uh, bad, can you still contact your family like you would be able to if you were an angel? As he, because he believes that spirits pass on to the angels. Or are you kind of limited from that if you're a bad person? Like, is that maybe that's your punishment in some senses? Or am I just misunderstanding? It's, it seems like you, you generally are around the people who are most like your true nature, right? Like he said that, oh, well, I don't think we talked about this, but he basically this idea of like divine marriage. He also like, kind of like divine divorce, that if the person you were married to in real life was, was not your best match, that you would actually marry someone else in heaven. Um, yeah, yeah. So I thought that was, that was like, whoa. And he was like, and if you were alone in life, you might find your match in heaven. And then I also like the idea, uh, it was like, um, no one is alone unless they wish to be. I was like, wow, that really, <laughs> that really speaks to me. So I, I think not, I think basically if you end up in hell, it's, I don't think you're necessarily going to communicate with anyone who is of that, that divine or, or goodly influence or nature. Yeah. So the way Swedenborg described it was like when you first enter into the world of spirits, just like that intermediate level, the people who greet you are fans, like family and friends and relatives, people that you know, or you knew from a previous life who had previously passed on. And then after you spend a year or two in that particular realm, and then you start revealing your inner nature, and then you move to wherever you're most comfortable. At that point, because you're with others who have the same dominant love that you do, there's not a necessarily desire to reach out to people you had previously known because you're so comfortable kind of where you are with those people who are so alike to you. I think that's kind of where that would be. I don't know necessarily in his kind of, in his cosmology if you could like reach out and like say hello or like have a discussion with your family. Like once you've already descended or ascended into the different like levels. But for sure, when you first were deceased and you entered into the world of spirit, you're greeted by people that you know from your lifetime. And it was actually really interesting because he, the Swedenborg Foundation at least, used the story of Ebenezer Scrooge from the Christmas Carol to kind of talk about like his cosmology is saying that like Ebenezer Scrooge continuously chose like wealth and putting people down and like scamming people for his life, which are all like evil dominant loves. And then he has this like crazy change of perspective, right? When he's visited by the three ghosts, but the like Swedenborg, according to his cosmology was essentially like he could totally have this change in kind of idea and like what he believes and change in personality to be this good person but it would take a lot of good action and good choices to kind of change his overall dominant love because that like he had been choosing evil loves for so long in his lifetime. So it would take many, many good choices in order for him to kind of rise throughout the levels of hell after death. I thought it was a very interesting way to describe that cosmology, but it makes sense. As we mentioned in Psychics of Paranormal episode, Swedenborg did have a huge influence on the spiritualist movement. I read somewhere that like, a spiritualist is quoted as saying that every spiritualist should have a bust of Swedenborg in in like their club hall uh, because of how influential he was. They like worship the dude, <laughs> which is kind of funny because he actually spoke out against contacting spirits, which is very much the opposite of what the spiritualists did. Um, what did, did do I have a direct quote from him? Yeah, he basically warned others that like attempting to contact spirits, it was too easy for evil spirits to fool people. And that the gift of speaking with angels was something that had to be given by the Lord rather than like something that could be learned. Obviously, though, the spiritualists uh, ignored that and they championed Swedenborg as uh, the sort of medium, the, the first uh, their, their first medium of their movement. Actually, another thing, but I think it was Sir Arthur Conan Doyle who actually said that every spiritualist should have a bust of Swedenborg in their hall. Um, he's... So Arthur Conan Doyle, a weird man. <laughs> uh, Phil, I, Phil, I have a question for you. Out of curiosity, did you ever like figure out kind of how Swedenborg thought of his contact like with the spirits? Was he contacting spirits like in the world of spirits, that like intermediary level, or was he engaging like only with angels um, because they had like a desire to maybe help and expand like his knowledge? I think to his mind, it was mostly angels because so when he talks about his crossing over, so like his whole life kind of a lot of his visions influence concept of astral projection. He obviously never called it that. He called it crossing over. 
however you viewed it to be dangerous is that you had to die you had to go through the process of dying in order to then be awakened to the spiritual world and he cited the that he saw angels on either side of him uh, and that they kept him physically alive by thoughts of divine love or whatever so i think he like went through all of the stages um all of the realms of the spirit world from my understanding so he was interacting with like some spirits like i believe he he mentioned like seeing a family member who had passed away but it was predominantly like he was being guided by the angels but then again in his kind of cosmology angels are just a sort of basically ascended people ascended people yeah yeah so i guess to him he wouldn't necessarily have made so much of a distinction it's funny because like the spiritualist totally like disregarded a lot of his cosmology even though they were like obsessed with him they disregarded a lot of his <laughs> yeah they just just disregarded like a lot of those ideas and just like contacted that first spirit world which i think is kind of interesting swedenborg had like a really unparalleled influence on not only the spiritualist but on christian mysticism and also western occultism he influenced uh, a lot of Freemasonry, which I found very interesting. There was actually a hermetic order called the Swedenborg Rite, I believe, which was like a hermetic order that what? they're obviously, yeah, they're no longer around, obviously, but they, uh, they modeled, they were fraternal order modeled on Freemasonry, and they had like several degrees that you would like go through. It like was born like a year after his death. Um, it lasted until like 1908 or something. Dude had like crazy influence. Crazy influence. Like, and it's so Everywhere. interesting to me that he like was a scientist for so long in the beginning of, the, of his life. I was, I was telling you both this earlier. Like he was this like super influential scientist at the beginning of his life and came up with like theories centuries earlier than modern science even began to like consider them legitimate. And then in his 50s, he just like, there was this massive, massive change and this like spiritual awakening and he just decides to like throw everything away from the science and it's like i'm just gonna go full on like theologian and i was just like oh my god like that's wild it's crazy how drastic that change was but also how influential he was in both areas like he was obviously super influential as like a theologian and i suppose you could say a mystic but he was also just as influential as a scientist freaking prodigy <laughs> any other last thoughts yeah, God, why did we never hear about this man? I feel like the more I dove into him, the more I was like, God, I gotta read more. <laughs> I gotta know more. Like, I feel like there's just so much about Swedenborg. Like, the angel numbers, pff, that blew my mind. Yeah. I think a lot of it probably came from the fact that, like, at the time that he proposed a lot of this, it was it was so heretical. Like, yeah, just just not even, like, worth considering. And so it was just kind of push aside as this like bullshit <laughs> or the, these teachings that were just so antithetical that like why would you even give them any kind of credence and even in regards to many of his scientific theories at the time they weren't given enough credence and then later we're like he actually like knew what he was talking about and yeah <laughs> right like i was reading that his early works his early theological works were published anonymously and that it wasn't until much much later in his life that his name was even attached to them and some of his works like some of his scientific works were like lost until like the 19th century or mid 19th century when they rediscovered them and were like oh this is Swedenborg stuff and then they were able to to trace it back to him so I think that's part of it too is that there was some anonymity anonymity yeah non anonym anonymity whatever. <laughs> and whatever <laughs> um that like he he kind of because he was so heretical like he kind of didn't like it seems like he was very much like a household name amongst the people who knew him but he was still shrouded in mystery just like his life and see like he never founded any churches he didn't seem to be like an egotistical figure really at all he'd never founded any churches never had a desire to found any churches never married just kind of uh wrote and just did and he preached charity and like lived a, a very frugal life <laughs> he was maybe a vegetarian he too maybe yeah. he married in heaven and now he's like super happy yeah i hope so he seems like a great guy <laughs> yeah married to his work married married to mysticism but yeah and he was a vegetarian and preached a lot of aspects of charity and poverty like religious poverty so yeah, I think in some ways he didn't necessarily want to be well-known. 
And one thing to mention as well is because um, he published his work so um, so many years ago, you can find the Arcana Celestica, um, Heaven and Hell, you can find loads of his published work online for free. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more about his cosmology and his influence on the occult and on science, then um, you can do so quite easily. There's loads of stuff there, like way, way more than I could read, which is sad because it was fun reading. I'll link that in the episode description so it'll be easy for you to access. And I think, yeah, the Swedenborg Foundation has, like, their notes on him all for free because they're just, like, they love the guy. They're, like, I don't care. Download these PDFs, please. <laughs> like, I was looking at it. I was, like, wow, they have all their books for free. They're, like, yeah, take them. You can read a lot about him and his cosmology. It's it's fascinating stuff. I really encourage everybody to to read it. I certainly have a couple of his things on my reading list now. All right. I think that's it. <laughs> We're going to be called Test Tubes in Swedenborg now. There you go. Tessie's <laughs> the official name change, everybody. It's no longer TTAC and it's now TTAS. No. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll call it for this episode. Um, thank you for listening, everybody, and for hanging in there as we dive into the incredible world of Emmanuel Swedenborg. And we will see you next week. Have a great day, everyone. Mm-hmm.